So um, steal this presentation. Uh, there's a URL. Uh, you want to grab it now or later. Um, I'm Dan. Uh, I um, was involved in this travel startup uh, that Joe talked about in the 90s. Um, we built uh, an incredible company. Uh, went from three to 600 people in what seemed like a crazy amount of time and, and went IPO and, and sold it and everything. And it really came out of that experience, um, kind of transformed, um, empowered to some degree, but also really uh, wanting to make a different kind of impact um, to um, have something that I would have much more lasting appeal than, you know, kind of through the exit and, and uh, you know, would, would reach out and touch people's lives in, in a more meaningful way. And um, over some fits and starts, that's led uh, to this project, which I will tell you about. Um, so here's a preposition for you, um, a, uh, a goal, um, a question. Uh, how, how would we annotate all knowledge? And the, probably the most important question that we'd want to ask is why would we want to do something like that, right? So let's first think back. Uh, let's think back a thousand years to the year 1013 and think about all of the really, some of the really interesting documents and bits of human knowledge and, and, and product that may have happened since then. This is the Magna Carta. This was uh, first, uh, this was written in, in year 1218 uh, um, and is the basis of, uh, out of which a lot of law and a lot of the principles of fundamental principles of human rights uh, and, and things like uh, habeas corpus and um, uh, uh, protections against double jeopardy and things like that came uh, out of um, uh, in, in England. Uh, but all we have is a document. Um, we don't have the thinking that went into it. We don't have the first draft. We don't have the uh, edits that might have uh, been made. We don't have, we don't know how many people necessarily contributed to it. Um, and we don't have any of the thinking that maybe came out of it later. I mean, yeah, well, there's documents that are historical documents that we that historians might point to uh, and say, you know, this was a result of that. And, and but we can't derive them by looking at this document. Um, this is a familiar one: the Declaration of uh, Independence. Um, you know, a lot is said about the founding fathers. People argue about what their intentions were, what their um, what their meaning was when they wrote different pieces of this. Um, we have lots of writings by Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and so forth and people that were involved in this and we try to intuit what they might have meant. Um, but it's difficult to um, actually go back to um, the collaborative uh, process that resulted in this and tease that apart from, uh, from the document itself. Um, Communist Manifesto. Uh, interesting document has obviously been very significant in human history. What was what went into it? What came out of it? What did people contemporaneous with this document in the 1850s or 60s think about it? What did they say about it? Um, we have a little information, but not as much as we could. This is Einstein's um, um, uh, paper, original paper on the uh, special and general theory of relativity, uh, published in 1916. Um, what, uh, what did the peers um, that, uh, of Einstein's time back then have to say about this? All we know is papers, but we don't necessarily know the conversations um, that, that existed around these documents. So that takes us to now. Um, we have no shortage of things to annotate now. We have laws, um, we have scientific articles, the news, Wikipedia itself, um, books, data, um, a mountain of information being created. So if we start to annotate it, how do we know that um, the annotations that we create, the things that we say might be preserved into the future? Um, the web sometimes is very unstable. Um, as the years go by, um, how do we create a project, an organization, an effort to capture these things and store them maybe for very long periods of time? Uh, in fact, time, it turns out, is really the defining design criteria for how to create the world's annotated knowledge. 
Um, this is Katerina Fake's copy of Ulysses. Uh, she's an avid annotator. She marks up everything. Um, so this is just one person's copy of Ulysses. Um, so one of the other really interesting design problems is if you start to annotate things, it gets very crowded very quickly. So how do we design for that? In 1945, um, a uh, very interesting guy named uh, Vannevar Bush wrote an article in The Atlantic, which is still on their website, um, called As We May Think. And in it, he imagined this thing, which we call the web now. Um, he imagined this mechanical machine with which you would use to browse the world's knowledge. In fact, he created the first tabbed web browser. It's tab A and tab B. Uh, and he, this article is very interesting. You could please read it. It's one of the most fascinating historical documents that really has brought us to where we are at. And anybody in this room, I assume, is, whose profession and livelihood is directly tied to this guy's thinking. Um, and in the, on the kind of towards the end, he imagines this, prof you know, after having imagined the web and what it would mean to have all the world's knowledge linked together at your fingertips through these cool glass plates, he starts to imagine what the implications of that would be. And that a, a profession would arise of people whose sole purpose was to blaze trails through the world's knowledge and connect it together and link it. Not people that created the knowledge, but people that would come along later and, wreath and, and connect things and, and um, share those trails um, and those linkings with other people. So fast forward, there's an interesting company that got started uh, recently. And um, last fall, they um, raised $15 million from uh, Andres and Horowitz. Some of you guys may remember this. Well, the really interesting thing was the blog post that Mark wrote um, about the investment that they made. Back in 1993, when Eric Bina and I were first building Mosaic, it seemed obvious to us that users would want to annotate all text on the web. Our idea was that each web page would be a launch pad for insight and debate about its own contents. So we built a feature called group annotations right into the browser, and it worked great. All users could comment on any page and discussions quickly ensued. Unfortunately, our implementation at the time required a server to host all the annotations. and We didn't have the time to properly build that server, which would have obviously had to scale to enormous size. And so we dropped the entire feature. I often wonder how the internet would have turned out differently if users had been able to annotate everything. So there's been a lot of projects that have uh, come, and some of them gone, most of them gone, uh, since that time, 20 years ago, almost to the day. Uh, and um, who, people, very well-meaning projects, who have tried um, to create systems that would allow us to start annotating all the world's knowledge. And we basically still don't have that. So the question we started to ask in getting, um, st starting this project or trying to imagine how we would solve this problem is why. Why still, why we still don't have this? So we came up with a list of seven reasons. Sh this is the short list, there's a lot more reasons, but these are the ones we think <coughs> were most important. No peer review model, so there was a lot of noise, not a lot of signal. Um, they weren't annotation based, you couldn't necessarily um, some of them allowed you to, to um, comment in line, but a lot, of them, a lot of them didn't. And really no way to powerfully link to those annotations uh, that were created. Um, no real um, focus on the cold start strategy, so this is a tough problem, getting the world to start annotating everything. Um, how do you solve for that? Um, not open, not interoperable, not based on standards, not open source. Um, um, insufficient design uh, to really solve for some of these problems, and really short-term thinking. This isn't a project um, that we uh, are trying to solve for a year or two. This is a problem we're trying to solve for a long time. So Hypothesis was um, a project that we started to take those problems that we found by interviewing a lot of the people that were involved in these previous projects and invert them into a set of design criteria to solve them. Um, so, Hypothesis is a nonprofit uh, 
to enable the community moderation of the world's knowledge. Um, we are funded, uh, we've got a Kickstarter start, um, but uh, funded through grants from the Sloan Foundation, Mellon Foundation, uh, and the Shuttleworth Foundation. So our project, uh, our goal is really to bring two things together, um, annotation as the first one, and then peer review um, and a way to boost signal uh, as the second. So why annotation? Um, it turns out that annotation is one of the most powerful paradigms that we as humans have developed over time to come together and think about things collaboratively. Uh, this is the Talmud, a page out of the Talmud, um, created uh, orally thousands of years ago, first written um, in the um, 500 approximately AD. Um, and what it is is the oral history, which is in the middle, surrounded by basically collaborative annotation over time by rabbis and scholars. It's threaded. There's off-page references. Um, all the really interesting stuff that we still use in places like Reddit and, and Hacker News today as a way to think about things. Um, this is peer review. It's post-publication peer review, which is actually the paradigm that uh, we're moving towards in science now with um, some of the new projects that are out there like PeerJ and, and uh, eLife and PLOS and so forth. So what is exactly is annotation? Um, annotation is like an arrow with a payload. It has an address. It has something that's being said, something that's being brought with it that you are contributing, um, and it has a target. It's specific in the way that it points into the things that it talks about. Annotation has been done for a long time. This is a page out of a treatise on optics that Sir Isaac Newton happened to write in the, in the margin of, and we kept this uh, book because of who he was and what he said. Um, this is half of an annotation, or two-thirds of an annotation. It's got a target, so it's located specifically on the page. It has a payload, which is what Isaac said, um, but it's missing an address. You can't reference it. So that's the cool thing that we get with digital annotations and with the web and URLs and, and so forth, is we get um, that addressability of the thing that's being said. And that really unlocks the true power of, of annotation. Um, there is a movement now called Open Annotation. It's a W3 um, community working group, which means it's not ossified yet as a standard, but still actually has um, a very vibrant group, small group of people working together um, to um, create it. It was really formed by two groups that came together over the last couple of years, a bunch of uh, old scholars studying manuscripts um, that wanted annotations to be able to lay on top of uh, images of those manuscripts um, that, that uh, contributed and, and translated them and provided context and, and uh, historical references together with a bunch of, the, of people out of the biomedical space who wanted to use annotation to weigh semantic context, uh, concepts on top of journal articles that could be uh, interpreted by reasoning machines to understand when new articles would come out that would challenge the semantic relationships between, say, the relationship between a gene and a protein or something. So those two groups came together and said, can we come up with a common way to create interoperable annotations um, that we both could share. Uh, and out of this is um, a draft, a new uh, draft of which just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, and it's called Open Annotation. If you go to the W3 uh, working uh, site, you can uh, read all about it. Um, there are already millions of annotations that are being produced today using um, this um, um, uh, uh, precursors uh, drafts of this primarily in the biomedical field where they're already starting to, to do these um, uh, machine readable annotations. So what we get with open annotation is we get the ability to point specifically to things. We have, can enable things like threaded discussion. Each part of the thread is a first order object. Um, it's simply an annotation, an annotation of an annotation. It's addressable. We can chain references from one place to another, like Vannevar imagined trailblazing our way across the web. It's standards-based and interoperable, and it works across formats, um, locations, and, and different technologies. Um, there's some interesting things 
that you get when you think about um, the different flavors of the way that you might um, create an annotation too. So an annotation has a, an address, a body. It points to something um, like a URI or URL, but then it has what's called a selection. So a selection, so say you were pointing to an image. The image was, had a URL in the web, but you weren't just pointing to the whole image. You were pointing to like a globular cluster in a star field um, of a, an astronomical uh, um, uh, image from some telescope. So you might actually use an SVG to draw a picture or a border around the cluster you were pointing to. The, so the selector might be the SVG laid on top of, uh, of your target URL. So an annotation contains all three of these components. But a comment, like just a comment at the bottom of a web page, doesn't have, isn't pointing into the web page. So it's just kind of below the fold. So it's missing this piece. Um, a highlight is an annotation without a body. We're not trying to say anything. We're just um, selecting some text in yellow. A bookmark is kind of like an annotation that just points to a URI. So lots of different services that store things like this that are on the web today are actually flavors of annotation. So when you tag something with SoundCloud, you're actually just bookmarking a song that point, you know, maybe has a specific uh, reference. Or if you're highlighting something with a website like uh, Awesome Highlighter or something, you're really creating this kind of an annotation. So annotations might be very versatile in their ability to um, serve different kinds of things. The web, this is the web that we have today. Um, when we point to things, when we reference things, primarily we reference them with URLs that point to the top of things. Yeah, we have anchor tags, but those kind of have to be implemented by the people that created the thing in the first place. They have to have created those hashtag intermediary anchors. It's very difficult for us to point specifically to a single character in a web page by using a, a URL that's universally um, interoperable. So the promise that annotation um, brings is the ability to point inside of things, maybe with that payload, that comment that I want to contribute. And that allows us to do interesting things, like point many times specifically into the thing that we're talking about, like as we make points or make an argument. We can also point to things like video, like point to a specific sequence of 20 seconds at this uh, point where somebody said something um, that's interesting. Um, we can point to a gene um, in a, using a gene browser. We want to talk about this specific gene that codes for this protein. And I want to lay an annotation on it so that when somebody else is browsing that protein, they can discover that. Uh, maybe it's because a new paper was just written or somebody has an interesting data set that, that investigates that. Um, that ability to contribute thinking lets us also do all kinds of interesting things in that, in that uh, body, in that payload. Uh, we, can, we can challenge something that we're reading or support it or make a joke about it or provide a reference to a third thing um, that relates to this. Um, make a spelling correction. Um, we could suggest an alternate wording for the thing that we're pointing to, um, like uh, an amendment in, in a, to a bill in Congress. If we can aggregate sentiment of many annotations on top of the same thing, then maybe we can get a sense of what the aggregated sentiment is. So maybe we can almost see like a heat map on top of different places where people, um, maybe people with strong reputation or, or um, people that we trust, tend to, to converge in their thinking about things. Um, that brings us to the second part of, of what we think is important, with, which is the peer review component. So how do we select for quality? How do we design systems that let us um, like the squelch knob on a ham radio set, establish a noise floor um, so that at least the things that we're looking at aren't spam or obvious trolls. And then once we've established that noise floor, how do we create a volume knob that lets us turn the most interesting stuff up so that it surfaces um, most readily um, when we're looking uh, at different places in the page? Um, we think this is a really fascinating problem, and actually it turns out it's a whole branch of study in science, and uh, it's a kind of a, a blend of, uh, it's called reputation theory, blend of uh, game mechanics, um, sociology, math, and statistics, and 
Um, so we had a little workshop last year and brought a bunch of people together to think about that and came up with a kind of reference design for maybe how to implement that. And I won't talk a lot about that tonight, but happy to later. So um, what are some design challenges uh, of the project? So the first thing I just want to say is um, this is, uh, we don't have all the answers, right? We have a lot of questions. We have a lot more questions than we do answers. I will show you some prototype stuff tonight, um, but we need your help. So um, if anybody thinks that this is an interesting problem, um, please come see me. We actually have a, an open rec uh, for a full-time uh, UX person, by the way. So, um, so here are some problems that we want to solve for. Um, high volume. So the sticky note approach to annotation, like you'd get with track changes in Microsoft Word, doesn't work. We can't just stick annotations on the page. We've got to separate the annotations from the page, disintermediate them, so we can deal with volume. So how do we do that from a design perspective on top of things like documents? Um, location and number. So I kind of am looking through a page. How do I see how many annotations there are, that there's a density, that there's a, a statistically significant blip of stuff there? And then how do I maybe understand how many things there are um, before I decide whether I want to look into them or uh, there or not. There's a lot of different reasons you might want to annotate stuff. You might, it might be for personal research, so I want to create notes that only I can see. I might want to annotate in a small group, like a class on top of a document and, and, and make notes that other people could see. Or I might want to make something that the whole world can see because I have something that's that important to say. So there's different contexts, so we've got to solve for that problem. The fourth problem is one of the most uh, challenging problems that people that have looked at this before have grappled with, which is that the web changes a lot. Um, uh, go to an article in the New York Times. Now that they're on the web, they actually change all the, art the articles all the time. So there's a cool site called News Diffs. You can actually look at changes in New York Times articles over like minute by minute through the day. Sometimes these articles change 200% twice over all the text in them um, just in the space of eight hours. Uh, it's actually astonishing. I didn't I know that or I would not have even believed that if somebody had told me about it. So how do you stick an annotation to something that's continuously in flux? Um, so there's minor things where you kind of want to still have that annotation stick there because the change isn't significant enough um, in terms of meaning or in terms of, say, you know, Levenstein distance. Um, then sometimes there are substantial changes to a document where you wouldn't want to resurface the annotation, but you might still want to know that there was, at one point, something there. So how do you deal with versioning? Um, in science, a lot of times you have multiple formats for exactly the same thing. So you have a PDF and an HTML version of exactly the same article. Well, if you annotate the PDF, it would sure be nice if that annotation showed up on the HTML version. But how do you, how do you solve for that? Um, not everything points to a specific place on a page. Sometimes you just want to make a comment about the whole thing. Um, so how do you um, deal with uh, stuff that's specific in nature and stuff that's not um, and, and uh, integrate them holistically? We, we really want annotations to show up wherever we're at on the web. We want them to be there, like Mark Andreessen built this into the browser, well, that's kind of where it needs to be. But there's also a, a case for there to be a website or a place that I can go see all the things that I annotated, um, see what's trending, um, stuff that's not at the website. So I've got a balance between something that I want to be portable and with me all the time and something that's not. Um, sometimes I may want... Um, a, an extension that I have in my browser so I can annotate things, but what if people don't have the extension in their browser? So how do you create the ability for people to uh, uh, annotate things where the people don't have extensions and, and so forth? How do I show and surface sentiment and reputation? And then how do I uh, solve um, for um, the cold start? So. Uh, annotation should be everywhere we are. So let me show you um, a quick uh, little prototype of some stuff that we've been uh, experimenting with. 
uh, and are about to release in a very early kind of alpha form. So we're, this is um, currently a bookmarklet. Um, we, uh, come back here. Okay, that must be like a hot corners or something going crazy on me. Cool. Um, so I'm at uh, the Nature's website. This is an article, a um, pretty popular one, um, on uh, uh, the human biome. Uh, and I've got a uh, little JavaScript I've injected into the DOM here. This is via a bookmarklet, but we're about to package this as an extension. Um, it pops out uh, as I scroll down the page. Um, so as I scroll down the page, I can see uh, annotations that relate to different pieces of text. So here is uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who's come back from the grave to uh, annotate this particular sentence. Um, and if I click on this, I can see uh, the pull quote that he talked about. Um, and I can see that what the original annotator created that's associated directly with that text. And then um, a, there's a threaded discussion uh, that can ensue. Um, if I want to comment on this, um, I can make a small um, contribution here and save that. So this is, um, this is an idea, right? We don't have the right answers, but we think um, it is a question of whether you even want flat versus threaded comments. I mean, this is one of the web's biggest like, idea wars. Uh, talk, you know, get uh, Jeff Atwood on one side, and um, I don't know who you'd get on the other side, maybe me. Um, and, and we could sit here and argue about this for hours. So we, we chose initially a threaded model simply because thread allows specificity. And so if we're already predicating this whole project on the basis that we want to be specific, um, and particularly when we want to enable tools for things like scientists, we think a threaded model is an interesting place to start. It's the hardest model conceptually from an architectural point of view to implement. And we have a view of this that we're tinkering around with that actually flattens this um, from a threaded view to a flat, flat view so that maybe you could toggle between them. Um, but interesting open question for us um, is, um, is this uh, um, an interesting approach? Um, you can, uh, should be able to do this. Yeah. For some reason, out the uh, panel usually can be drug up. Um, out and back so you can make a little more room if you want. Um, we're also experimenting with how to do collapsible threads. So if it gets really deep, 10 deep, um, you start to get everything shrunk up against the right-hand side of the frame, maybe you should start collapsing threads past uh, a certain depth to give you more room uh, as, uh, as you scroll through really deep conversations. So those are just um, some, some different ideas. Um, everything uh, here is um, this is actually in uh, beta, it's not on this test site yet, but everything is linkable. So every single thread um, will have it, you, you'll be able to expose a URL to that thread, put it in a tweet, have somebody click on it, and take you right back to this page and showing, showing that annotation on top of it. Um, so that's something that we think is important to kind of allow the bits and pieces of conversation that are evolving around a certain thing to be able to be shared um, uh, with other people. Uh, so let me go back to my presentation here. Right, so I'm going to go this way. If you have a real quick question about this, cool, but I think there's a bigger question period at the end. Okay. Um, so that's. Um, Kind of, I had some static slides for this, but I've showed some of this. Um, creating an annotation is as simple as selecting some text. Um, uh, we want to contribute our thinking. There's a threaded view. We want to be able to expose links to things. We want to be able to stick those links in tweets. Um, all this is open source software, so you see there's a hypothesis URL here. But if you want to run your own annotation store and have the links that your people are capturing into threads 
be coming from your store of annotations. Like for instance, say you are uh, your IBM and you want people to be able to annotate corporate documents against a store of annotations that's behind your firewall that people on the outside simply can't get to, um, then um, you might, th that URL might be from an internal resource as opposed to um, our service, for instance. Everything should be embeddable, so you should be able to take an annotation um, and stick it on a card and embed it in a blog um, and have um, the things that are being talked about and pointed to be live and able to be accessed through um, URLs. Um, the, um, ch the change thing, like how do you deal with changing text is really interesting. So we've um, collaborated with some people there and we're working on a uh, library um, that we think uh, has a, uh, takes some of the thinking that people have uh, co contributed to over the last couple of years and uh, combines it um, into a new library. So say I want to link to um, the, uh, a piece of text like this one. And um, the text that I'm um, uh, annotating is uh, going to change. Like there's a spelling error there. So somebody comes along later and, and um, corrects that spelling error. So the things I'm, I'm pointing to has actually changed from, from where I originally annotated it. Um, how do I create a sticky annotation that's, that still points to that? Well, this is a pretty simple example because only one character changed. But what if different characters change? What if this was a you know, more complicated example? It actually turns out to be one of um, the, the stickiest problems out there. So we've, um, we have a, an implementation that uses a prefix and postfix and selection approach. One of the things we think about is important about annotations is that we should be able to come up with an algorithm for creating robust anchors to annotations that would have worked on documents a thousand years ago. So we don't want to use things like XPath or DOM related ways to point into uh, text because first of all, they didn't work between formats. And second of all, if we move away from things like XPath um, in 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, um, then our annotations break. So how do we create something that's purely textual and contextual um, that, that solves this problem? Um, so we uh, have a fuzzy anchoring algorithm that lets us um, lazily attach um, context wings um, and then come to a, a conclusion about whether the thing that's in the middle is close enough to what we originally annotated that we want to continue to surface that annotation. Um, we should be able to survive edits. So let's take, imagine that we take that paragraph there um, which, uh, and the, our co-author um, moves it to the bottom of the paper um, that we should still probably stick that annotation to that same paragraph. So we need a, a, an anchoring approach um, that allows us to do that. Uh, like I said, we need to, solutions that let us annotate between documents um, that uh, may be identical uh, except that they're in different formats. So we need things like concepts like canonical targets um, that, that let us create um, a common reference um, uh, points between um, different formats. We need to solve the storage problem. So uh, we're um, in the, um, um, have a preliminary agreement, but we're in the middle of structuring uh, an agreement uh, first with the Internet Archive to back up all annotations that are being made. We we'll also um, uh, are discussing the concept of sending them a pull request every time a page gets annotated so they can take a fresh snap of it. So we actually have a version history of the page every time it was annotated. Obviously, that only works for publicly facing pages that don't have robots.txt turned on. Um, but um, so we still need good, robust uh, anchoring strategies for the rest of the web. Um, but longer term, um, we probably need to solve this problem um, using different strategies. Um, uh, you know, single copies of things are very brittle. So uh, maybe we need to start looking at a truly federated approach um, using you know, strategies like the BitTorrent DHT uh, or other ways to create kind of a holographic uh, image of, uh, of what's being annotated. Um, and the last thing I'll say is uh, the cold start problem for us is um, maybe the most interesting and the most challenging of, of anything that we're looking at. So um, we uh, just announced a workshop here funded by the Mellon Foundation to bring um, a, 
uh, about 100 of the people that are most focused on finding ways to annotate the knowledge in their communities together to help us think through how to solve uh, some of these problems. So people in the sciences, um, people um, focused on uh, legislation and the law, um, journalists um, to kind of share um, annotation projects that they're working on, new technologies that have kind of come out, things that are building on top of open annotation, but also to share uh, perspectives from their community about what they need as users um, if um, we are to um, uh, uh, think about um, tackling um, this problem together. So this is um, um, the beginning of our thinking about how do we solve uh, this cold start problem. So that's it. That's, um, that's the end of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Dan.